Okay, awesome. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm Dr. Nicole Smith, a prenatal and pediatric chiropractor in Burlington, Massachusetts. And with me tonight is Bridget Dujardin. Bridget is the owner and the lead occupational therapist of Boston Sensory Solutions. Bridget, can you tell us a little bit about your story and how you got into this profession and to where you are now? Sure, absolutely. Thanks for asking and thanks for having me, Dr. Nicole. I am an occupational therapist. I have been for a long time. <laughs> I went to Boston for an undergrad and then I did my graduate degree in occupational therapy at Tufts University. And I actually went into occupational therapy thinking that I wanted to work in hospital settings. And after doing my field works and my internships in acute patient and rehab hospitals, I actually decided I was much more interested in community-based work, working with individuals, with families, and with um, adults with special needs. So I spent the beginning of my career working with adults and children with special needs in significantly separate schools and programs. And then after having my own children and kind of becoming a mom and understanding the many demands that go into parenting and raising children, I shifted my focus into pediatric occupational therapy, working directly with children and families with all levels of challenges, um, you know, kind of along the typical spectrum of development, as well as kids who might have different diagnoses that require specialized intervention. And from that, Boston Sensory Solutions came to be. I opened the practice in February of 2016, starting very small, thinking it was going to be me and 15 or 20 families a week, and then realized there was a real need for this type of clinic in the greater Boston area, and really in the immediate um, Boston and surrounding communities. So I opened my practice in Milton, Massachusetts, shared some space with a couple of other fabulous practitioners who were opening practices in similar areas. And then the clinic grew. Uh, we now have about two thirds of the first floor of an office building in Milton, Massachusetts. And I have four other therapists who work with me at Boston, four other occupational therapists who work with me at Boston Sensory Solutions. We've recently added speech therapy to the clinic um, in February of 2020. And we have a fam fabulous office manager who helps with all of the insurance billing and reimbursement and things like that to help families get the services paid for. That's awesome. I love it. Um, can you explain a little bit to our viewers what sensory processing is and if there's a difference between that and regular pediatric occupational therapy? Sure. So occupational therapy is a rehab profession that helps people, adults, kids, elders, people with and without disabilities, injuries, accidents, illnesses, to be as independent as possible in their daily lives. So occupational therapists are really tasked with helping people to fulfill their life roles as competently and as independently as they'd like to. So pediatric occupational therapists help kids fulfill the roles of childhood, to be good siblings, good students, good classmates, um, good friends, and to do all the activities associated with those roles. Sensory processing disorder is an aspect of development that we treat as pediatric occupational therapists. Occupational therapy is a very broad field in terms of how we can help people and who, who benefits from our services. So there's sensory integration is one frame of reference that we use in pediatric, in any occupational therapy, but specifically in pediatric occupational therapy to kind of shape our treatment approach and to shape the activities that we use in treatment. But we are always using play. We are always focused on increasing function and increasing independence and helping kids to be the best siblings, playmates, classmates, children that they can be. 
Yeah, that's great. And I think, you know, chiropractic is a little bit similar in the case that it's a very broad profession and you have so many different avenues you can take. Mm -hmm. And then being able to work with kids and working with sensory processing with children is a little more focused of an area within the profession. Absolutely. And but I'm one. also very careful to say that what we're doing is occupational therapy. Um, Absolutely. You know, sometimes you'll read things about, oh, there's sensory integration therapy or there's listening therapy or there's, it's, it's occupational therapy because we're always focused on the occupation, on the task that the child is trying to fulfill. And the way we get there may depend upon the specialty or the path that the therapist is taking with that. Can you touch upon a little bit, because you had mentioned that it's always play and you're using that to, you know, do this for therapy with the kids and to help them. Can you touch upon what the goals are and how play specifically is used? Sure. So like I said, the goals always are independent function. How is this child fulfilling his or her life roles and what activities do we need to help the child build, remediate and become more independent in? But we know that the task of childhood is play, right? Especially early childhood. That's where kids learn and grow and develop best. And when a child is joyfully engaging in activity, that's when their best learning and development happens. That's when their synapses are connecting well. That's when everything is jiving and going so well together. You know, we say um, neurons that fire together wire together. Yeah. So when kids are playing and having fun and are laying new neural pathways for the skills and the underlying components that we're working on. So there's been some research done recently too on using just rep repetitive exercises versus play in pediatric therapy. And we find that a child may only need to do an activity five to eight times in play for the skill to be embedded versus if they're doing the activity just as a splinter skill repetitive task, it can take hundreds of times to actually build that skill. And I think it goes back to the neurons that fire together, wire together. You know, when they're mm -hmm. joyfully engaged and everything's happening simultaneously as it does in true play with children, then the learning is seamless and the development is seamless. Absolutely. The other piece of it is the kids want to do it. <laughs> so then they are putting forth their best effort and they're really working hard to complete the fun activity or to get the craft built or to climb up the rock wall. And they're willing to put forth that extra effort that helps them to actually build the skill. Yeah, of course. And I definitely think it's a positive or a benefit for them to create a positive relationship with the exercise and the task at hand rather than seeing it as like, you know, a dreaded a job that they have to do. And instead, it's like you said, it's very exciting and they're enthusiastic about it and they work harder for it, yeah. which is extremely important. Yeah. And then we can kind of say like back to it, like, oh, remember when you were able to do this? on the scooter board. I wonder if you could do it while you're making your bed at home. Do you think you could reach that far? You know, no, no. <laughs> but like, yeah, challenge accepted. <laughs> exactly. yeah. No, what would you say? So if we have parents who are home and they're wondering whether or not their kid might be a sensory child, what are some things that they should look for, think about, or pay attention to? And at what age would a lot of this come about? Sure. I think it can vary. I think in terms of age, um, we tend to get a lot of referrals for kids in the early elementary school ages. You know, that's when they've kind of been at home and they've, parents often seamlessly accommodate some of these sensory challenges or sensitivities because we know our kids so well. And we know, oh, if I just don't give them the turtleneck, you know, they don't like turtlenecks or they don't like these socks or they don't like um, chunky food. So we just accommodate it. You know, we just give them what they like, which is fine. But then as they get a little bit more out of our homes and they get into school and they're interacting with teachers and other kids who aren't seamlessly accommodating because they don't know that that's the child's preferences, 
for the community setting just doesn't allow for that level of accommodation, then we tend to see more challenges fulfilling those daily roles that I talked about come up. And that's when we tend to get referrals um, for kids. I think kids who are, you know, sensory kids or ha may have a sensory processing disorder are often the kids who are having the big meltdowns that we just kind of can't figure out why. Our parents will feel like everything was fine and then all of a sudden she lost it. Or I don't know what triggered it. Or it's just this little thing. Or it's always these shoes. Or it's always when she gets water on her face. I think we tend to think of sensory meltdowns a lot in terms of tactile defensiveness because that's where it comes up. You know, very sensitive to clothing, very sensitive to different touch, doesn't like water, those kinds of things. But there are so many facets to sensory processing that that's why it's really important to get a good evaluation from an occupational therapist who um, has some specialty in sensory integration and sensory processing disorder to really kind of unravel what is going on in your child and what sensory system might be over-responsive or under-responsive and how to best mitigate some of those challenges. Absolutely. Can you touch upon, um, I know typically we're familiar with about five different ways of sensory processing. And when you and I spoke before, we talked about seven of them. Do you yeah. mind touching upon that a little bit? Sure. So I say to families all the time, you know, in regular world, we have five senses. We know what they are from kindergarten, right? Seeing, smelling, tasting, touching, and hearing. But in occupational therapy, we actually have eight senses. We have those five, and then we have proprioception, mm -hmm. vestibular processing, and interoception. Interoception is our internal sense of our, how we are feeling. So we know when we're hot, we know when we're cold, we know when we're hungry or thirsty or have pain. Um, I think people can relate to that one really easily and maybe just never gave it a name, but that's the name for it. Some kids and adults are really challenged in that area. They're just really under responsive. Like they don't know, they don't recognize the cues for hunger or the cues for fatigue or the cues for overheating and they can find themselves in a challenging situation because that kind of gets away from them. You know, people refer sometimes um, to like a cranky adult or a cranky kid as hangry. You know, you got so hungry that now you're angry <laughs> and you're hangry because you missed those cues or you just didn't have an opportunity you know, to eat. But there are those kids who constantly miss those cues and we end up, you know, having to keep them on a routine so that they do eat on time and they don't kind of lose that emotional control associated with being hungry until we can help them build the awareness of those internal senses. Um, vestibular processing is our sense of movement. It's our sense of our own movement as well as the movement of objects and others in the world around us. So how fast are we going? What direction are we traveling in? How fast or how slow is another object coming at us? Um, it's very closely tied to our visual system, which would make sense if you think about directionality and speed. You know, you're getting a lot of cues about movement from your visual system. So when kids have challenges with vision, there's often uh, some challenges in the vestibular system and vice versa. Sometimes kids who have vestibular challenges also have some visual challenges. Uh, I think the best way for people to understand the vestibular system kind of gone awry is that sense, I don't know if you've ever felt it, it you're sitting at a stoplight and maybe there's a left turn lane next to you or something, but the car next to you starts moving, even though you're still stopped at the red light with your foot on the brake. And for that moment, you feel like, oh my gosh, I'm moving. Yeah. You have that like mild panic of like, what am I doing? <laughs> Um, and that is the disconnect between what's actually happening and your vestibular processing system. And in kids and adults who have vestibular processing challenges, they can feel that level of disconnect from their world very frequently. It's kind of their baseline norm. 
and that can be very disconcerting. The vestibular system is very closely tied to our emotional regulation as well, which we can talk about a little bit later. Um, but I think it makes sense. If you're never quite sure kind of what's happening with movement in the world around you, it certainly makes sense that you'd be a bit emotionally dysregulated. Um, and then the eighth system, in no particular order, is our proprioceptive system. And that is our awareness of where our own body is in space. So if you closed your eyes and I moved your hand and put it on top of your head, with a good proprioceptive system, you would know where your arm is or where your hand is, even though you didn't see it go there. You have these little receptors in your joints that give you information about where your body is in space, and those are your proprioceptors. Pressure to those receptors is generally very calming to our nervous system. So we use proprioceptive input or heavy work or deep touch pressure activities a lot to help kids remain calm and to better regulate when we're beginning to work through some of the sensory pieces and challenges. Absolutely. Now, can you, so you mentioned a little bit emotional regulation. Can we touch upon that as well? Sure. So emotional regulation is kind of one of the skills we all need to get through life, especially right now while we're all in quarantine. Um, emotional regulation is your ability to match your emotions or your affect to the situation that you're in. I think a lot of people think, oh, emotional regulation means I'm always calm. It doesn't. You know, if you're in a situation that's scary or that's dangerous or that, you know, requires a 911 call or something like that, then you're going to be heightened. You're going to be stressed. You're going to be anxious. You're going to be in that fight or flight mode. And that's appropriate in that situation. And that's the regulation piece of it. You know, you're matching or you're regulating your level of energy. We call it arousal in OT, you know, kind of just your baseline state of being to the situation that you're in. So, you know, if you're sitting at the dinner table with friends, having a nice meal, then you would expect to be calm, attentive to the conversation, feeling relaxed and enjoying the meal. Um, that's a good place to be at that situation. It's appropriate to be tired and kind of lower energy, lower arousal at bedtime. Um, so being able to match your emotions and your level of energy and arousal to the situation that you're in is emotional regulation. Kids who have challenges with that aren't necessarily able to do that seamlessly. Um, and again, it's kind of one of the tasks of child development. I mean, young babies, toddlers, even preschool kids aren't able to do that task seamlessly, and that's developmentally appropriate at certain ages. But we expect the level of control that they have over their own regulation to increase with age. And when it doesn't, then that's sometimes what brings people in to see us. Absolutely. Now, do you find so? With us and the kids that we see in our office, a lot of times we find that they're really stuck in that sympathetic tone where, you know, like you touched upon, if there was something scary that was happening, that sympathetic nervous system would be elicited and that response would be there. But for some of these kids, always in that. So their internal world seems to be so noisy that they have to shut out everything that's going on outside. And you know, like you had mentioned with proprioception, chiropractic and the adjustment, we apply pressure and our goal is to elicit that parasympathetic, that rest and digest. Mm -hmm. um, and that way they can integrate a lot better. But how do you find that those children who are stuck in that sympathetic mode in that really tense environment are able to do the play exercises with you? And how are they able to integrate the therapy that you're doing with them? very slowly, but they do. And I think a lot of times they're in that sympathetic response because they're inundated by their sensory world. Those are your true sensory defensive kids. But they have to be in fight or flight because they need that level of energy to be constantly assessing their world. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, I think you and I talked about it a little bit when we chatted earlier, 
and it's also a little vignette on my website. But you and I can sit here and have this conversation right now and be focused on each other. And like my computer is making a tiny buzz in the background and my kids are downstairs doing their homework and I can hear people walking around if I think about it. But I can very easily focus on our conversation and not even hear that stuff because my brain is automatically screening it out. It's not salient information right now. It's not something I have to attend to. If the fire alarm in my house started going off right now, I would hear that and I would attend to it because that's novel information. And it wouldn't be expected. It wouldn't be something that my brain automatically decides, oh, don't worry about that. Keep talking to Dr. Nicole. Um, but kids who have true sensory processing challenges in terms of over-responsivity have to make those decisions consciously all the time. They have to consciously say, oh, that buzz in the computer is not important. Oh, that's just my brother walking around downstairs. I don't have to listen to that. And if you think about the level of energy that that takes and the level of vigilance, really, and that's where they need the sympathetic nervous system because they need that level of vigilance to be constantly screening in and screening out salient information. So when we can help their nervous systems change the threshold at which they need to screen in information and decide that it's salient, then we see the whole system settle a bit and be able to get out of that fight or flight, that sympathetic response. We call it, you know, autonomic nervous system, high arousal, all that kind of stuff. And we'll say like, okay, the kids are coming in in a very high state of autonomic nervous system arousal. And how can we help them bring that down? And it's good to have some tools and some strategies to bring it down in the moment. But the real goal of our work with kids and families is to change the nervous system enough so that it's brought down at baseline. They're not always having to do a strategy to accommodate. We're changing the wiring in their nervous system so that it becomes more seamless for them. Yeah, I love that. I really love the way that you worded it as far as helping their nervous system to change the threshold. That is perfect. Um, and with that, so for parents who are viewing who might be home with a child who has sensory processing disorder, what are some things that you recommend that they could be doing right now during this time of quarantine? Sure. I think really for all parents who are home with all kids who are out of their daily routines, who are a bit heightened, I mean, we're all in high arousal right now just because of the state of our world. Um, I think going back to some of those proprioceptive activities, because in general, those are calming. Those are organizing, we say, to our nervous system, and they help kids to process their world a bit better. So deep touch pressure, lots of big bear hugs. Our head is our biggest receiver of proprioceptive input. So I teach kids to do hair wiggles. You know, they kind of push down on their head, and I encourage them to make their hair wiggle, because then I know they're pushing hard enough, right? Um, lots of deep breathing. We do lots of birthday candle breaths. So I'll say to kids, you know, okay, what's your favorite kind of cake? Oh, chocolate or strawberry. Okay, and, and you're four, so let's put up our four birthday candles and let's, let's smell that chocolate cake and blow out our candle. You know, just to just say to a kid, like, take some deep breaths. Or how do they do that when they're, you know, when they're young? Um, so just lots of calming and organizing activities. Heavy work activities is what we refer to it in OTS, but anything that's getting a lot of deep pressure into those joints to kind of squish those receptors that we talked about earlier, carrying heavy bags of groceries, pushing in chairs, stacking things, um, filling up a laundry basket and dragging it around the house or pushing their you know, baby brother or their cat or their dog, giving them a little ride in the laundry basket. Um, lots of outside time, you know, running and jumping and playing. And then giving kids time to settle back down. I think that is really important. And I think we, as adults, sometimes miss that. Like, we transition really well in general as adults, we should. <laughs> Um, you know, so we've, we've got the kids outside and they're running and they're playing and they're on the swing set or they're jumping rope or they're 
running around with you know their siblings and that also gets them in high arousal in a positive way right like it's exciting it's fun they're kind of hyped up and then we say like okay five minutes you got to come in for dinner in five minutes kids have no idea what five minutes means <laughs> so i think making it concrete you know like two more times around the backyard or three more pumps on the swing and then you have to come in for dinner so we've got to give kids a warning before we ask them to transition from one activity to another and we have to make it really objective for them so that they know what we mean so we're talking the same language because five minutes you know could mean anything and like as adults we say five minutes and then we keep talking and then it's ten minutes like they don't know um, so keeping things really very specific and then maybe asking them to do some of those birthday candle breaths or to tell you what they're going to do when they come in the house, but some kind of transition activity to help them kind of calm down, get into that more attentive verbal state of arousal from that like wild kind of running play before we then ask them to come into the house. And I think that can prevent a lot of the meltdowns and big emotional reactions that we see when kids are asked to transition between activities. Now, would you recommend parents creating some kind of a schedule while they're home in quarantine with their kids to keep some structure within the household? I think that's really important. I think first, it's really important for us as parents. Um, I'm working from home. We have transitioned our entire practice, OT and speech, to telehealth. So I'm in sessions on Zoom or on Doxy, uh, HIPAA secure platforms for visits with kids. Yet my own family life is kind of going on in the background. Um, so I think we all need schedules so that we know kind of what's coming. Again, like avoid some of those meltdown transitions, have some predictability to the day. I think it's really important to wake up at our regular wake up times to go to bed at our regular bedtimes, to eat our meals at regular times. Those are some kind of anchors in our day and then fill other things in around them. I think having some outside time every day is really important, the weather permitting, but even if it's a little bit rainy, like just get outside for a short walk, let the kids ride their bikes or run or play, get your, excuse me, your hands in the dirt if you can, if you're in that kind of community, do some gardening. But to have some predictable, types of activities. I don't think it has to be, oh, at 10 o'clock we always have snacks, but like there's a sequence to the activities that happen in the day with those anchors like getting dressed, going to bed, eating meals, having some outside time. And then I think school age kids are certainly doing schoolwork from home and to have a predictable place to do that I think is important um, and a fairly predictable time of day to do it, again, to give some anchor and some structure to the day. Absolutely. What are, um, so you had mentioned that your practice has gone entirely to telehealth. So yeah. what are some resources that are out there for our parents that are viewing that might be home and don't yet have their team that they can reach out to? Sure. I think that the wide variety of outpatient providers have moved to telehealth. Mm -hmm. I think if your child was on an IEP or getting some specialized services from school, I think it's really important to reach out to the school and see how they're continuing to provide those services. Lots of school districts are doing um, Google Meetup or Google Classroom or Zoom times to continue to provide some of that support. Um, we are still doing evaluations through telehealth. Uh, we provide families kind of with a list of activities, um, supplies really that we'll need for the activities that we'll ask them to do ahead of time. Very simple household things that we all kind of have on hand. And then do the therapeutic activities and the evaluation activities over telehealth. Having families on board and around while those sessions are happening is very helpful because they often are our hands while we're coaching them through what we need the kids to do in the sessions. And that's very, very helpful. Um, so we are certainly around. I think behavioral health providers are around and we're happy to help either just chat with people or set up a time for an evaluation. Excuse me. We're also running groups for kids, which are free. Just as a community resource, we have a craft group 
on Monday and a movement group on Tuesday in the afternoons that are meant for those kindergarten, early elementary school age kids, I'd say four or five through like eight or 10 years old um, that are happening on secure Zoom rooms. We are also doing a social group for the later elementary, 10 or 11 years old, up through middle school for just some social time with peers of their age who are kind of in the same boat. You know, maybe you just kind of need to get away from your own family time or to engage with other kids who are kind of living in the same place as you are. Absolutely. So as we come to a close, is there anything that you would like, maybe a few key takeaways that you would like parents to have that are viewing right now? Sure. Um, I think the first, the underlying thing is when kids are having meltdowns, when kids are really struggling, they're not giving us a hard time, they're having a hard time. And I think to be able to shift our perspective a bit as parents will help us as parents and will also help the child. You know, they're not necessarily just being behavioral. There's something underlying. They're anxious, they're scared, mm -hmm. they're challenged, the task is too hard, they're hungry, they're tired. What is it that's going on? And I don't say that to excuse, you know, poor behavior. We all kind of have bad days. Um, but I say it to give parents a perspective on you know, your kid's not trying to aggravate you. Your kid's having an aggravating time. Mm -hmm. And what can we do to help fix that the next time so that the whole family dynamic can run a little bit more smoothly? Um, so it's just kind of a global, I think, takeaway. And then I think the other thing is, like I mentioned, have those anchors to your daily structure. Get some predictability in your days at home. And just use this time for play and life skills. We're all gonna do the best we can, I think, with the academics and the school expectations, but most of us are not teachers. And this is a real opportunity for us to teach our kids life skills and play skills that we didn't necessarily have time for when we were all kind of commuting and going to school, going to work. Um, it's a hard time, I get it, I'm doing it too as a mom to be working and parenting 24 seven, it feels like. Um, but it's just a really unique time. And I think giving ourselves the grace to say some things are too much and we're gonna focus on other things is okay to do too. Absolutely. Do you, um, and this question might be something that we're not yet able to touch upon, but I know schools are closed throughout the year, but would you recommend any advice for when things start to open up again and parents are starting to bring their kids back into their routines, um, easing into them, maybe some ways that they should approach getting back into things. Or if I'm a little ahead of myself no, here. No. I mean, I would love to be able to think about that. I don't think we're there. And I think some of it is going to depend upon when that happens. Mm -hmm. You know, are we going to be transitioning into camp? Are we going to be transitioning into summer activities? Are we going to be transitioning into back into school? I think it will depend on each family's unique situation and what they typically do during that time of year when we are finding ourselves opening back up. And I think regardless, having that daily structure, having those anchors to your day will be really important. Um, and just being open with kids and Kind of letting kids know what's coming and understanding that it may be anxiety provoking it may be exciting um maybe lots of things for kids and for parents so that's, we have no experience with this i think yep. <laughs> human beings right now um but i think just kind of being all in it together as a family and as a community is really important Absolutely. And I think it's extremely important for anyone viewing and families out there to know that having that community and having people to lean on is one of the most ideal things you can do right now. But then also to know that there are people out there like myself and Bridget who are here for you and we want to be on your team and we want to support you and encourage you. 
Um, and with that being said, Bridget, this has been so amazing. Thank you so much for all the information you've provided. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. So I'm going to share my screen real quick and put up contact information. So if anyone would like to reach out to Bridget, this will be the way to do so. And bear with me one second. Here we go. Awesome. So my office like chiropractic in Burlington is still open. I'm there with two other doctors, Dr. Linda and Dr. Jean-Marc Slack. If anyone is looking to get a hold of us, you can visit the website drslack.com or give us a call. And also on the screen is Boston Sensory Solutions information. I know Bridget, you said you were you have transitioned to telehealth. Would you have them call or preferably go to your website to schedule with you? Either one. This the office phone does forward to my home to a, a business line in my home now. So I'm actually the one answering that phone. Usually it's our clinic manager, but right now I have it. Um, and then there's a lot of information on the website. I should have mentioned earlier and I didn't. We recently started a blog because of all of this um, social distancing and people being at home a lot. So we post a blog usually on Wednesdays with a six to eight activities that are occupational therapist approved, um, kind of with a different theme. Last week we had calming activities. This week we focused on fine motor activities. So there is general information about sensory processing. There's a blog with different activities that people can try to do with pretty simple household materials. And then of course, there is a contact us page on there that you can send us a message. Um, and there are also intake documents if you're interested in having your child evaluated or getting some therapy sessions during this time, we'd be happy to help with that. The other really nice thing right now is most of the major insurance companies are covering speech and OT and lots of medical services without a copay or a deductible if you're using telehealth. I think it's a really nice way to encourage people to stay out of medical offices that they can do via telehealth. Certainly some things you need to go in for. And I think having Slack Chiropractic open for hands-on care is a fabulous resource, especially with all the safety measures you guys have put in place there. But I feel confident that we can do speech and OT virtually. Um, and having the no copay is really a nice treat for families right now while we're all kind of working from home and being at home. Absolutely. And you know, our office as well, we're very grateful for how flexible the insurance companies have been and how cooperative they are during this time to keep families getting the resources and the care that they need. But thank you everyone for viewing and joining us tonight. And again, Bridget, thank you so much for this. Thank you, Dr. Nicole. I'm gonna stop my screen share. All right, everyone have a great evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.